is because so actually this will help then that's it all right god bless you all so i am teaching um uh, prophet romel and uh, a few ninjas that are here with me about um the difference between prophets and gifted people in the prophetic and I'm trying to make a distinction for um, for prophet to understand so that he can function powerfully because he is not gifted, he's a prophet. Now the issue is this, is that our capacity to minister prophetically is not up to God. It's up to us. Because the gift is God given. Let me ask you an example. Let me let me ask you a simple question, right? This is just a simple prophetic teaching. You are practicing, you are running. All those things is what will determine if you will be a fast runner or not. It is not about prayer. So somebody who has been gifted by God to run no longer prays about running that person ought to work on their ability to run they have to make sure that their conditioning is good they eat healthy they rest enough in order for their body to be rejuvenated to recover in order for them to run so a prophet doesn't pray about prophesying it's a mistake that is what a gifted person prays for I think I think I, I'm okay now. Okay. Yeah. That is what a gifted person prays for. A gifted person prays for God to talk to them. But a prophet is put in an office because God has chosen them to represent him. So if I've been called to represent God, my assignment is not to pray for God to speak to me. That means God has already committed to speak to me. Make sense so far? Yes. Is this making sense? Are people online, is this making sense? Yeah. So, you don't become a prophet, you are born a prophet, but you can become a gifted person. Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he may deliver unto you a prophetic gifting, right? Paul said we can honestly pray that we may what? We may prophesy. There's nothing wrong with that. So, according to God and according to the scriptures, the best gift is the gift of prophecy. Why is the gift of prophecy the best gift? Because the gift of prophecy is God's voice. So, a gifted person ought to pray to hear God. But a prophet cannot pray to hear God because that is the assignment. What a prophet needs to master is how do I position myself to hear God and when God speaks, how does he sound like? Because a prophet is not prophesying simply by inspiration. That is what gifted people do. Gifted people are inspired to have a word to encourage you, to edify you, to lift you up. Or oh, I just feel in my heart God says he's going to lift you. God is going to bless you. God is going to uh, uh, remove all the burdens that you have had. Just trust in him. Look to him. God says you should focus more. All that is prophetic exhortation. It's by inspiration. It's not that you heard a voice saying, tell them to focus. Tell them to do this. You didn't hear a voice. You are inspired. You felt it within your spirit. This is what this person needs. But a prophet has an audience with God. A prophet is already walking with God. He's not waiting for God to come. A prophet is already walking with God. A prophet has already been sentenced has already been sentenced by God. God has already joined himself to him. So a prophet doesn't pray, Lord, speak to me clearly. That's a wrong prayer. Yes. That means you don't know what you're called to do.
prophetic accuracy is not because of prayer. Because Jesus already said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you. I will hold your hand out. Why is it that Christians can't hear? Whether you are a prophet or you are just a gifted person prophetically, we both are supposed to hear God. What we hear God for may vary or the capacity will vary, but the reality is even if God says good morning, it will be powerful. Yes. Anything God says is, is going to change somebody's life. So what is the missing link? The missing link is you don't understand how God speaks. And in order for you to know how God speaks, you must position yourself where God is speaking. So when we pray, Lord, let me hear your voice clearly. You are saying God has never spoke, spoken clearly. And that is a lie. God is always clear. So what is the missing link? The missing link is that you are lukewarm. You have not chosen an extreme. You have not chosen an extreme. Before God speaks, where are you positioned? Because you notice, Balaam could tell that Israel is blessed. How did he know that? He was employed to curse Israel. But in the process of cursing Israel, he stopped. He said, listen, how can I curse what God has blessed. Remember, this is a wizard. He knows nothing about Israel. He's hired. Go and curse them. He stands there and he starts to curse, release curses. This is a wizard. And the wizard comes back and says, listen. How can I curse those whom God has blessed? And how can I stop myself from speaking what he's speaking to me? Wait, wait, wait. wait. That's what Balaam said. Yes. Can you find it for me? Yeah. Look, this is what Balaam is saying. Yet this man is against God. This guy is ready to destroy the people of God. But this guy knows what God is saying. Ah, I feel, oh, I'm about to go offline. I thought this will inspire somebody. If you understand me, just put number one. Just type one. If you can hear me, whether you're on Facebook or you're on on uh, on um, Instagram, uh, just type one. Just type one. Just type number one. I just want to see number one. As many number ones. If you are getting it, type number one. Did you get it? Mm -hmm. Imagine. Palam is saying, oh, my big brother Harmony, God bless you. God bless you so much. The greatest producer ever. And a powerful man of God too. So it's crazy. You think about it. Did you find where Balaam is speaking? Uh, it's Numbers 22, 36. Can you read it for me? And when Balak heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him unto the city of Moab, which mm -hmm. is in the border of Arnor, which is the utmost coast. Uh -huh. Come close so that they can hear too. Uh -huh. And Balak said unto Balaam, Did I not earnestly send unto thee to call thee? Wherefore camest thou not unto me? Mm. Am I not able to indeed to promote thee to honor? And Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto thee. Mm -hmm. uh, lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God putteth in my mouth, that shall I speak. <laughs> this is a wizard. A wizard is saying, I can't speak anything except what God has put in my mouth. And it's a wizard. He's a wizard. No Holy Ghost. <laughs> ah! No, no Holy Spirit. The guy is telling you, how can, I, how can I speak to you except what God has put in my mouth? It means that, listen, God has spoken. The guy is calling him. He's saying, I told you to bewitch these people. I told you to do this. I told you to do that. I am calling you to come to me and you're not coming. He said, I came. But I can't say anything except what God has put in my mouth. What? Then the same guy who is telling you that I can't curse these guys because God has blessed them. God has spoken to me. Okay. He says, but we can figure out something. 
let's make these guys fall into fornication. And when they fall into fornication, then we can actually curse them. Isn't that what he said? He created a thing that they fell into fornication and then he cursed them and the curse came. So somebody who doesn't like God, who is on the other side, can hear God better than you full of the Holy Spirit. It means there is a spiritual link that you're missing. Do you realize that before Moses was born, the wizards knew about Moses' birth before they children of Israel? They are the first ones who discovered that our Savior is being born among these people. But the people who the Savior is being born among them had no clue. That the wizards had a foolproof plan how to stop this thing. They said, listen, we need to kill all children under two years. They even knew the age. They knew the exact age that this child will be under. There will be no baby beyond two years old. This savior must be under two. And they put it at two years old because they knew that it's such a small baby. But just to be secure, anything under two years old, a boy, kill it. How did they know? You see, the devil is also waiting for God's word to come out of heaven. Because you have to understand when God speaks from heaven, it is public news. It's not secret news. This is why when God wants to bless you or the blessing of God is coming, all hell breaks loose against you. How did they know to attack you? How did the devil know that's when to make your children sick or for you to lose this or for you to go through this or you to experience? How did the devil know this? How did the devil know this? That the moment you're about to have the biggest open door of your life that the Lord Jesus has ordained for you. That is where everybody that you even, even your own sins that you did in 1905 that you repented and that is when they will be resurrected. That is the time Satan will try to discredit you. That is when everything goes loose. Is because they are also waiting for God's word to enter into the atmosphere. They're also, the difference is this between you and me. Okay? The Magi, the three wise men, or the Magi that went to Jesus' place of birth. Okay? The Bible says that they saw the stars. They were stargazing. And the star led them to where Jesus was. But first they passed through the palace. And they told the king, Ah, do you know that a great king is being born among you? He said, Ah, uh, yeah, we also know. We are seeking where he is so that we can worship him. When you find him, tell us so that we can also come and worship him. Notice, the kingdom of darkness is also trying to interpret God. The Magis broke the code of where Jesus was. Ah, uh, you guys can't hear what I'm saying. Yes, sir. They crack the code of where Jesus' exact location is. The ones who did not love Jesus, the ones that wanted Jesus to die, their decoding stopped that he is born. But we don't know where he is. So their capacity to decode is the forensic prophecy. One could just know that he is born. The other knew exactly where he is. They both heard from God because it's not the devil who revealed it, it's God. He was there. Mm. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is somebody catching this? Yes. Yes, I am, sir. Uh, uh, yes, wow. Uh, Go to the high priest who said it's expedient for one man to die. Just think about it. They both knew Jesus is, is, is born. They both knew Jesus has come into the world. They both knew it. It wasn't a secret. So but one knew the specific place and the others did not know. But they all saw the same star. But they all decoded different things. And they were both accurate. But one was deeper than the other. <laughs> so is it God that spoke to one clear? 
No. It's just one had the ability to understand God's language and the other one did not. Yeah, go ahead. Listen to this. John chapter 11, verse 50. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people mm -hmm. and that the whole nation perish not. Mm -hmm. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Notice this. This is a man who hates Jesus. He has gathered people to kill Jesus. And they are discussing how they should kill Jesus. But the man prophesies accurately, yet he has hate and forgiveness, malice in his heart. But he prophesies accurately concerning the destiny of Jesus. I feel like I'm, you see, this is the problem with the religion. Religion deceives you. Yes, sir. Big Walking time. with God close reveals things to you. It makes you understand that the way you see, Jeremiah and many prophets used to pray this prayer. Show us your ancient ways. Show us your hidden path. Teach us your ways. Remember, God says it like this. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. The problem with Christians, you're not spiritual. So you could be Christians, you're not spiritual. A hundred percent. Because you can just be a Christian by title. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Spiritual things are discerned by the spiritual, not the Christian. Yes. So the devil can discern God beyond a Christian. You see, many of you, I was watching this one man of God and he was actually talking negatively about me. Mm. But he says this, and notice I called him man of God. I didn't even demonize him. Because I understand that people's understanding is different. Mm. But this man of God was actually talking badly about me. He said, mm. when I said, Christians don't know how to discern God. He said, well, we do. We have the Bible. Mm. Well, please tell me, where did the Bible teach you about prophesying? There is no scripture that tells you to prophesy. You know that? Yes, sir. Most of the prophetic principles you know about prophecy are not even biblical. Mm. Mm. All the Bible talks about you should prophesy, desire to prophesy. When you speak, speak as an oracle of God. Where is it written how to give prophetic words in the Bible? The Bible says, lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why hasn't the Bible shown you the system? It just said, lay your hands. How many people are laying hands and nothing is happening? Because some things are mysteries, they're hidden. So there's a formula to follow. A hundred percent. There's a lifestyle that is tied to it. When the Lord Jesus was about to go on the cross, one of the things that he did, uh, I believe, a few days before, is he wanted to wash his disciples' feet. And his disciples, Peter, said, Lord, you will never wash my feet. Do you know what Jesus told him? What I am doing now, you will not understand. But one day, you will understand. Jesus was doing a strange ritual that has never been written in the Bible, where he was washing his disciples' feet. A lot of people have taught that and said, oh, it means that uh, serving one another. That's not what Jesus was doing. Jesus wow. made it very dramatic. Peter said, you will never wash my feet. He said, Peter, what I'm doing now, you don't understand. But later you will understand. If I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. You have nothing to do with me. Whoa, 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 Jesus. This is not that serious. How did he get so serious? Because it was a spiritual thing that Jesus was doing. It wasn't just the washing of feet. But if today I tell you, take your feet, let's wash your feet. You say, I is doing spiritual witchcraft. He's using marine spirit. <laughs> Christians are foolish. This is why it takes a certain level of purity. For you to understand the ways of God. There is a certain level of purity. You can come in Auntie Benz if you want. Just 15 minutes. We have another meeting. 
You, you can come in. You're... No, no, I'm good. I'm good. There's a certain level of, of purity. There is a certain level of purity that is required for actually a true born prophet to reveal secrets to you. Do you know Jesus had a specific diet? He never comes to mind. Do you know John the Baptist had a specific diet? Prophetic yes. diet. It's in the Bible actually. Clear as day. It's in scripture. There was a certain way that Jesus had to eat. There's a certain way John the Baptist had to eat. There was a certain way prophets had to eat certain things. <laughs> but you don't know that because you have been you have diluted God. One of the biggest mistakes Christians have done is we have diluted God. We have made God like, uh, uh, you know, those juices that you have to dilute to drink. Mm -hmm. We have messed up the flavor of God because we've become, we've become so, we have made God Kool-Aid. You know, you just take, you mix it in your house and you put it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. There are certain things if you don't understand prophetically and you eat, it can make you prophetically dull. Yes. There are certain things John the Baptist could not do, but other men in the Bible did. John the Baptist was told never to touch alcohol, but Paul drank a little wine. In fact, he said that a, a, a glass of wine is good for your stomach because the Bible tells you, do not be drunk with wine, be drunk with the Holy Spirit. Drinking is not a sin. Drunkardness is a sin. That's what the Bible says. But there were people that God said, you don't touch any alcohol ever. Yeah. Why did God say that? And everyone that God said, this one don't touch this. They spiritually, they were different from other people. Apostle Paul was powerful, extremely powerful. There are some things even Apostle Paul did not do. Why is it that God is giving certain people with certain assignments? It's because Christians don't understand spiritual things. There are so many hidden mysteries that if we were to sit down and actually start sharing it. Uh, A lot of people demonize. So in short, if you don't understand the ways God speaks, you might even demonize people who are actually hearing from God. <laughs> so it's not something that's really... Like, like an example is this, right? I'll give you an example is this. There's a time I taught people about the salt covenant. Some fools who know nothing about spiritual things. They say, ah, that's new age witchcraft. Yet it's in your Bible. <laughs> you can't help Christians. I'm telling you, you can't help them with anything. Why do you use anointing oil? Where did the, where did the anointing oil come from? It's 100% a ritual. Do you know where that ritual came from? It came from shepherds. Shepherds were the original people that used anointing oil. They used oil to soothe their sheep when flies were eating them. When flies, you, you know this, you probably, you can, you can Google ointment. Yeah, yeah, something you about. yeah, that's where anointing oil came from. The shepherd would take the oil, pour it on the sheep's wool and let it soak so that their skin can heal up and the flies that were eating them will get off them. But a prophet somewhere saw it mm. and took a prophetic direction out of it that we started using it in church from back in the day. But church was not the first people that used anointing oil. It was shepherds. Mm. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What, what does the hope Psalm 23 said? It, read it all. Anoints my head with oil. That's where it comes from. It was a shepherd thing. It was not a church thing. This thing did not come from church. This was knowledge that the shepherds had. Let me use this to, to suit my... Sh but then the prophets saw it and they saw it prophetically. They understood. If you're sick, anoint the prayer of the elders. Let the elders anoint them with oil and pray for them and they shall be healed. It is prophetic to symbolize healing. It is prophetic to symbolize that you have been chosen. Not that the oil is choosing you. But you are used to it. You have never questioned it. So you yeah. think that it is... No. I think it's very good. Let me ask you. Are Christians the first people to baptize? No. A lot of cultures in the world, even demonic cultures, do water cleansing. Mm -hmm. Go to the Ganges in India. There's about a bunch of uh, Hindus washing each other and saying they're washing their sins away. Is it not true? Sure, sure. They have never read the Bible. But they have a ritual of cleansing. So does it mean baptism is evil? Because also evil people are doing it. No, it doesn't. You have to be a fool to think like that. You have to be a complete fool to think like that. Go to the Ganges. You'll find people, Hindus, lining up to be washed and to be cleansed. Go in the Amazon, you'll find them doing the, the cleansing rituals. Go to Africa, you find people at the rivers being bathed to be cleansed. But John the Baptist also was at the river cleansing people. So does it mean, does it mean that baptism is demonic? In fact, the original cleansing was for the priests according to uh, uh, Christian theology. It was Moses that was told by God, uh, 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 told by God to to cleanse the priests this way and to do this. We need to do this. We need to do this. Prepare them this way for seven days. You will do this. You will do that. You will do that. And you see it lost for a long time. Elisha comes and tells that man, uh, I forget his name, go and bathe seven times in the Jordan. After that, it disappears again until John the Baptist comes. But the priests were still cleansing people. How do we know? The pool of Belteza. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The pool of Belteza. The angel of the Lord will come and stare at the waters. Whoever goes in was healed. Now, because baptism, we have practiced it as Christian, right? Mm -hmm. The Hindus also do their own version of baptism. Yes. It's not from God. Does it mean that everyone that is baptizing is doing Hindu ritual? It doesn't. You have to be completely foolish to do that. This is why so many believers are missing God. Because just because you saw the world doing something. Okay, Moses goes before the Pharaoh. He throws his stuff on the ground. He turns into a serpent. Pharaoh's guys also throw their stuff. He turns into a serpent. Does it mean that Moses is a wizard? It doesn't. If anything, it shows you that the devil has made counterfeits of most, if not all, of the things that God has done. Is somebody getting what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. Yes. So what is the difference is not that I, uh, for me to hear God, I need to pray more. You already, as a Christian, you should already pray without ceasing. Mm. That's, good. That's a lifestyle. That's good. God has already commanded you to be a person of prayer. He says, my house shall be a house of prayer. If your body is his temple, you should be saturated with prayer. Mm -hmm. You should be full of prayer. You should be full of the word of God. That is standard. It's not anything supernatural. If a Christian says, I pray a lot, that's called being a Christian. Yeah. You don't get an award for praying a lot. Mm. That's standard. Jesus prayed all the time. He's our example. Mm. So you don't get a trophy for praying a lot. That's called being a Christian. <laughs> Elijah prayed a lot. Moses prayed a lot. The apostles prayed a lot. Everyone that was used by God was a man or a woman of prayer. So you praying so much or praying a lot means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It means you are a dedicated Christian. Other than that, you don't get an award for more prayer. No. If anything, prayer benefits us. 
Oh, Prophet Sean Morris, God bless you, senior prophet. So does that make sense? So praying a lot doesn't mean I will hear God. Even though praying a lot means I am positioned to hear God. But it doesn't mean I will hear God. It depends on the Holy Spirit to minister to them. A person in the office of a prophet knows how to, to navigate the spiritual realm to hear God. He doesn't want need to wait for God's word to come to him. He is supposed to be in tune and know everything. Absolutely God did the very thing he said. Positively God did the same thing he said. When he turned to pray, can you find that in Exodus? When he says the Egyptians, you see, let me show you what I'm saying in, in, in fact in scripture. Ah, it's extra deep. And then I'll finish with this. The reason why the church is empty of the prophetic is because when prophets are sent to you, you can't learn from them. You want to learn what you want. <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah, read it. Listen to this. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. And uh -huh. Moses said unto the people, mm -hmm. Fear ye not, mm -hmm. stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, mm -hmm. which he will show to you today. Mm -hmm. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Uh, next verse. The Lord shall fight for you, uh -huh. and ye shall hold your peace. Uh -huh. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel. Notice God is rebuking him. After he said all those things, Moses said, The Egyptians you see today, huh? you shall see them no more. Huh? I tell you, stay, hold your peace. You will see the power of God. And then the guy in his heart is saying, Oh, Father, save me. God said, Why are you praying? Tell the children of Israel to move forward. Speak to the water, stretch your stuff, part the sea and walk through it. And when the Egyptians come, I will close them in. Notice God was waiting for the prophet to speak. But if he was somebody with a prophetic gift, God would have told him what to do. Mm. But a prophet, God is waiting for them. Wow. Yeah, wow. That is the difference there. That's, that's, that's good food. Wow. <laughs> God is waiting for a prophet. But a gifted person is waiting for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. I'll say that one more time. God is waiting for a prophet. But a gifted person in the prophet, he's waiting for the Holy Spirit. Oh, Pastor Vlad, God bless you. God bless you. Great shepherd. So let me give you an example, right? This is in my Genesis when now God made me bold enough to start ministering to people, all right? An example, okay, let me use a recent one. Remember that Armenian family I pulled up, husband and wife? Mm -hmm. And I told the wife and the husband, I said, you guys are fighting, mm -hmm. especially because your wife has not gotten children yet. Mm -hmm. You've been married for such a long time, but the enemy has attacked your wife's womb that you guys are not having kids. The woman said, yes, in fact, they were, she was about to do a surgery for all those things and this and that and that and a whole lot of things. I said, it's okay. Go home. I did a prophetic act. I took a fruit, cut it into half. I said, the number of children you desire is what God is going to give you. Go home and make your baby. They went home after two months, after, after a few weeks. Mm -hmm. She was pregnant. Very quick. Very quick. Mm -hmm. After a few months, they were pregnant with twins. Now there are two girls are born holding two babies like this. All right. In the beginning, when I would do these things, I would ask God, I'll say, Lord, why did I have to speak? Say, because if you don't speak,